Nessa aula de introdução à tradução, eu vou falar um pouco sobre a ideia de invisibilidade do tradutor, comentando esse livro do Lawrence Venuti, The Translator's Invisibility, A History of Translation. Uh, I'm going to make comments on the first chapter, which focus, spe focuses specifically on uh, invisibility. There you go, this is the one. Uh, I selected some parts of the book here uh, because it's easier for me. So, first of all, Venuti shows how fluency prevailed over other translation strategies. This is the idea of invisibility. A translated text is judged acceptable by most publishers, reviewers, and readers when it reads fluently, when it seems to be transparent, the appearance, in other words, that a translation is not in fact a translation, but the original. The illusion of a transparency is an effect of a fluent translation strategy, of the translator's effort to ensure easy readability. So what is this illusion of transparency? For example, let's suppose you're reading a book in Portuguese, translated to Portuguese, let's say, I don't know, The Raven by Alan Poe, and then you're reading the translation. You don't say you're reading the translation. You say, oh, I'm reading Alan Poe, right? So you have the illusion of, be, of reading the, um, the original uh, author. You say, I'm reading Alan Poe, but actually your reading is being mediated by the translator's choices. So the translator's, um, the translator, the translator's ideologies and translator's beliefs, everything that the uh, translator uh, believes uh, it could be a good choice for that specific translation. So your reading is being mediated by someone else, but you still have the illusion of uh, being reading, of reading uh, Alan Poe, right? So that's the idea of trans illusion of transparency that Venuti mentions. And the more fluent the translation, the more invisible the translator, and presumably the more visible the writer, right? So again, you're reading Alan Poe, you're not reading the translator. You don't say you're reading the translator, you say you're reading Alan Poe. And under the regime of fluent translating, the translator, work, the translator works to make his or her work invisible, producing the illusory effect of transparency. So the more fluent, the more invisible. Why? Again, you, you don't, uh, if the translator is invisible, it means that he's a good one. You know, you don't feel that the text is awkward. You don't stop at some parts of the text saying, oh, this text seems, you know, awkward or this translation, uh, translation is not very good. So if the, the reading is fluent and you don't stop at some times, to, at times to, to uh, because you, you're feeling that the text is not well written, uh, if you don't have this feeling, you know, when you're reading a text, you don't have this feeling of the text not being well, well written, then you say that the translation is good. And then um, he mentions, Venuti mentions, some good criticism. Like, for example, uh, this is a compilation of uh, reviews of some books, and then all of them are good ones about the translations. And then some examples. Stuart Gilbert's translation seems abs an absolutely splendid job. It is not easy in translating French to render uh, qualities of sharpness or vividness, but the prose of Mr. Gilbert is always natural, brilliant, and crisp. Uh, the idea of being natural, you know, uh, this is the idea of being fluent. The style is elegant, the prose lovely, and the translation excellent. So when the translation is excellent, it means that uh, the reading is fluent. You don't feel that parts of the text could be awkward. That's the idea. And, and when the translator receives good criticism, that's the criticism that, that usually he receives. Um, fluent text, readable. If you're doing a test, for example, as a translator, and you're about to be hired by a publisher, and you do a test, to be hired, uh, what the publisher wants from you is a fluent translation detached from the original text. So they want from you a fluent, natural 
text as though it had been written in the target language, you know, as though it were really um, the original text. The reader cannot feel it is a translation. This is the idea of being invisible. And this is how you're going to be judged in your translations and uh, by your, your, uh, the person who's going to hire you. This fluency is what Eugene Nida denominates dynamic equivalence, which aims at complete naturalness of expression. So it has to be natural, has to be fluent again. And Eugene Nida was the first um, scholar who discussed equivalence in translation, and he divided into two, dynamic equivalence and formal equivalence. Uh, formal equivalence is more related to uh, fidelity to the structure of the language, uh, to uh, lexical uh, choices, and dynamic equivalence is more related to how natural the text uh, looks, the text reads, so it has to read naturally and, and fluently. The author, Venuti, okay, cites many positive criticism or comments on very good translations, all of them mentioning how fluent the translations were. This fluency is considered invisibility. Uh, these positive criticisms are, are the ones that I, I showed here. There are many, okay? All of them are positive. All of them focus on uh, how, how, how fluent they are. Um, and this is the transparent discourse that Venuti uh, mentions, the illusion of authorial presence. What is this authorial presence? Again, if you're reading a translation of uh, Alan Poe and, and you say, oh, I'm reading Alan Poe, of course you're reading Alan Poe, but you have this illusion of, um, of the presence of the author when you're actually reading the job of a translator. And it, so your reading is being mediated by the translator's choices. Uh, the translator's invisibility is a weird self-annihilation, according to Venuti, okay? He, uh, if he does a really, really, really good job, he becomes invisible. If he does uh, uh, not a very good job, and then the text is not natural, or the text, the translation is awkward, and then you say, oh, this translation is not very good, so the translator becomes visible in a bad manner. Editors, publishers, and reviewers enforce that fluency results in translations that are eminently readable and therefore consumable on the book market. So again, you're going to be hired, you're going to be tested, so you just have to be, you know, invisible and uh, for your job to be consumable. We're talking about job market here, right? But Venuti is not uh, worried about the job market. We're going to see later that um, he advocates in favor of a text, that a, a translation that looks like a translation. The author, Venuti, wants translators to be visible and translations to be read as translations, as text is in their own right. So for him, translation should be a textual genre. So instead of, say, say uh, let, uh, let's say, instead of being a novel, okay, it's a translation of a novel, right? He wants to change this discourse, the discourse of invis invisibility. The first step is to present a theoretical basis from which translations can be read as translations, as texts in their, in their own right permitting transparency to be de demystified, seen as one discursive effect among, among others. But we have to pay attention that what he proposes here uh, is very complicated for the job market. It's not going to be accepted. But academically speaking, uh, he's a very important scholar uh, that discussed that has discussed uh, important uh, theories in translation studies, right? And this is one of them. 
So when he proposes that translations uh, should be, you know, a, a, a text in their own right, which means that translations should be read as translations, translations should be a textual genre. He's proposing that all the job of a translator should be seen. Uh, so translators should not be invisible, they should be visible. This, this is what he says. So it's more like a political act than anything else. And then to discuss this, he comes with domestication and foreignization, which is an idea that was first discussed by Schleimacher uh, 200 years ago. Let me take a look. Which page was that? 20? I'm sorry, I forgot the page. Uh, 1920. This is 1920. Oh, 18. Ah, here. Schlemacher argued that there are only two ways of translating. Either the translator, this is very famous, a very famous quote. Either the translator uh, leaves the author in peace as much as possible and moves the reader towards him, or he leaves the reader in peace as much as possible and moves the author towards him. So uh, this is a foreignization and domestication. Admitting with qualifications like as much as possible that translation can never be completely adequate to a foreign text, Schleimacher allowed the translator to choose between a domesticating method, an ethnocentric reduction of the foreign text to target language cultural values, bringing the author back home and foreignizing method, uh, an ethno-deviant pressure on those values to register the linguistic and cultural difference of the foreign text, sending the reader abroad. So what's the idea here? That uh, the reader could be uh, closer to the author, which means that uh, the text would be uh, domesticated, domesticated, or the reader could be uh, closer to his or her own culture, so uh, the text would be foreignized. I mean, if the text sounds foreign, then uh, it's a foreignized text. If the text sounds, reads natural, it's domesticated. That's the idea. But then, when Venuti brings Schlemacher 200 years later, it's to discuss his ideas in a more political way. Uh, Venuti thinks that if you keep the text foreign, it's a way of uh, being resistant against, um, against the imposition of the target culture. Because he says that this is an imposition of the target culture on the translator. So he says that a foreignized uh, text would be a resistant translation. So that's why he discusses resistance in, in, his, uh, in his book. Domestication designates the type of translation in which a transparent, fluent style is adopted to minimize the strangeness of the foreign text for target language readers. And foreignization means a target text is produced which deliberately breaks target conventions by retaining something of the foreignness of the original. Uh, for example, when Machado de Assis was translated to French, I know that uh, I forgot what, uh, what type of, of um, food, but if I'm not mistaken, it was cocada. Cocada, I think, translated to macarrón. That was a domesticated text because macarrón is French, you know, and it's a very popular uh, type of candy. And uh, instead of using uh, the Brazilian type of candy, 
they used macajon in the translation. That's a domestic, domesticated um, type of translation. And also, audiovisual translation usually is domesticated, usually. Because uh, the jokes, for example, have to make sense in the target culture. Well, uh, then Venuti discusses domestication by bringing some uh, examples here. One of them is the translation of Freud's texts to English. And he says that the text was domesticated from German to English according to historical context. According to Venuti, the text was more, let's say, scientific and even more formal than the original in German because of the, uh, because of the positivism and scientism um, of uh, the United States. I oh, know it's not the United States, it's a translation in England. I have, yeah, England. But in Anglo-Saxon uh, community, um, if the text did not sound uh, scientific, it wouldn't be accepted as a scientific text. So uh, the language was, let's say, improved. You know, it was more scientific than the original text. Let me see if I can find here some, um, what page is that, 10, 25? Some things that I highlighted. Um, Bethel Haim's point is the, the author who is discussing the translation of Freud's texts. Point is that the translations make Freud's texts appear to readers of English as abstract, depersonalized, highly theoretical, erudite, erudite and mechanized, in short, uh, in short scientific uh, statements about the strange and very complex workings of, of our mind. Uh, one example was the word parapraxis in English, but in, in, um, in the original text in German, it was more like a faulty achievement, but then the translator used something more scientific to be accepted in the, in the community uh, think about the target culture. If the target culture uh, is more, gives more attention, let's say, gives more importance to a scientific text, so the translator, what he did was to, to make the text more scientific by choosing more scientific and more formal words. So according to, um, uh, to Bettelheim, Bettelheim, I think, the text is in German, uh, so Freud was less formal and, and used more uh, popular words than uh, the translations to English. The diction, a diction is a false cognate. Diction is escolha de palavras, não é dicção, né? não, é, não é pronúncia. The diction of much of this passage is so simple and common, forgetting uh, in the original in German. Even colloquial, go, go, out of my, uh, go out of my head in the original in German. That parapaxis represents a, cons a conspicuous difference, an inconsistency uh, in word choice which exposes the translation process. So uh, he says uh, that the text the original text was actually simple and even colloquial, and then the translation made it more uh, formal and scientific. Bettelheim suggests some of the determinations that shaped the scientific, uh, scientific translation strategy of the standard edition. The standard edition of, um, is the, the, the book being translated by Freud. One important consideration is the intellectual current that has dominated Anglo-American psychology and, and, and philosophy since the 18th century. So he's saying that uh, because of this domination of you know, the intellectual current 
that has dominated Anglo-American uh, psychology and philosophy. So this is the reason why the translation in English uh, has to be more scientific to be accepted by this society. Positivism being the most important English philosophical tradition. So if positivism is important in, in, um, in English philosophical tradition, so Freud's text had to sound more, uh, more scientific. That's the idea. And uh, so it was domesticated. How? Uh, it was domesticated because in the target culture, in the target culture, um, positivism was very important. In the target culture, there was an intellectual current uh, dominating uh, the target culture. So that's why uh, the target text had to follow these uh, ideas, these intellectual ideas, more scientific ones. Otherwise, a text in um, psychology would not be uh, accepted. Uh, the domesticated method at work in the translations of the standard edition sought to assimilate Freud's texts to the dominance of positivism in Anglo-American culture so as to facilitate the institutionalization of psychoanalysis in the medical profession and in academic psychology. So this is uh, the conclusion. So the text was domesticated to be more accepted in, uh, you know, to be institutionalized uh, as a psychoanalysis um, text in the medical profession. It's more like, ah, ok, então esse texto ele está bem científico, então ele, ele deve ser verdadeiro. Né? Essa é a ideia é, do, da, da, da domesticação dos livros, de, dos textos de Freud. In another, another um, discussion, it's about the translation of Suetonius' The Twelve Caesars, uh, written in 121. And this is interesting. Let me find it. Oh, let me read only this part. It can be argued, therefore, that the inconsistent diction, uh, word choices, in the English translations does not really deserve to be judged erroneous. On the contrary, it discusses interpretative choices determined by a wide range of social institutions and cultural movements. Some, like the specific uh, institutionalization of psychoanalysis, calculated by translators, others, like the dominance of positivism and the uh, discontinuities of Freud's texts, uh, remaining dimly perceived or entirely unconscious during the translation process. Traduzindo isso, quer dizer, as escolhas do tradutor foram influenciadas por uma corrente acadêmica é, que era é, que pedia, digamos assim, né, os textos mais acadêmicos, mais científicos. Então, as escolhas do tradutor foram direcionadas por esse ambiente em que ele vivia na cultura anglo-saxã. Agora, eu não me lembro se a tradução foi. Ele está comentando uma tradução. É, feita nos Estados Unidos ou na Inglaterra, mas está falando da tradução para o inglês. E o outro caso é, é a tradução dessa uh, The Four Caesars, The Twelve Caesars, no, The Four Caesars, The Twelve Caesars. And the, the translator, he, uh, he says that he domesticated the text. He says he domesticated the text so that it would be easier to read, just because the translation was done in 1957 uh, and it was a text originally written in 121. Let's see what the translator says. For English readers, Suetonio sentences, and some, uh, this is the author of the book, of uh, the Twelve Caesars, and sometimes even groups of sentences 
must often be turned inside out. Wherever his references are incomprehensible to anyone not closely familiar with the Roman scene, I have also brought up into the text a few words of explanation that would normally have appeared in a footnote. Dates have been everywhere changed from the pagan to the Christian era. Modern names of cities used whenever they are more familiar to the common reader than the classical ones. And sums and sentences, uh, sesterces, uh, I don't know what that is exactly, reduced to gold pieces. Ah, tá, é o, mod, uh, as moedas e o modo de, de pagamento. Uh, at a hundred to a gold piece of 20 uh, denarii, os denários, né? Which resembled a British sovereign. Uh, so he's, uh, the translator he, here, he's saying that he domesticated the text to be more readable. Porque senão ele ficaria com cara ainda de texto em latim. Então ele fala que ele deliberadamente domesticou o texto. Acontece que his version he wrote in the preface uh, was not intended to serve as a school crib, but to, to be readable. A literal rendering would be almost unreadable because it would, it would adhere too closely to the Latin text, even to the Latin word or order. So uh, he sought, the translator sought to make his translation extremely fluent. Então, a fluência né, do texto para ficar readable. Acontece que he deliberately modernized and anglicized the Latin. Cadê o problema? Deixa eu chegar lá. Ah, aqui é o que Venuti comenta sobre essa tradução. The translation is not just slanted against Caesar, but homophobic. This first um, appears in an inconsistency in the diction. Grave disease of a homosexual relationship to render Post, uh, this means surrendered his majesty to the king. Então, isso literalmente significa surrendered his majesty to the king virou homosexual relationship. relationship. In an anachronism, anachronism, porque até a palavra homossexual não existia, né? No, no homosexual, the word homosexual didn't exist when the book was written. So, a late 19th century scientific term that diagnoses same-sex sexual activity as pathological, at least when it was created in late 19th century. It was a pathology, not anymore, but it was. So, same-sex sexual activity as pathological and is therefore inappropriate for a nation culture in which sexual acts were not categorized according to the participant sex. Graves then leads the reader to believe that this relationship did in fact occur. Not only does he increase the innuendo by using suspicion gave place to scandal to translate uh, this expression that means the rumor is spread, but he inserts the loaded ostensibly entirely absent from the Latin text. Graves' version implicitly equates homosexuality with perversion. Quer dizer, o que ele quis dizer aqui? Um, uma frase que era surrendered his modesty to the king virou homosexual relationship. Uma outra frase que significava the rumor spread, quer dizer, eram rumores. Ele disse que... Como que ele traduziu? Suspicion gave place to scandal. Quer dizer, ele traduziu de um modo que não era só rumores. Ele, ele, um, ele disse que aconteceu mesmo. E do modo como ele escreveu, uh, implicitly equates homosexuality with perversion, que não era, um, aparentemente não era a ideia em latim. Então, na sua domesticação, ele usou uma palavra uh, opa, uh, anacrônica, é uma palavra que não existia quando o texto foi escrito, e ainda ele, é, quer dizer, dos anos 50, 
do modo como ele via a homossexualidade, então ele traduziu, é, filtrado pela, pela sua visão homofóbica do que aconteceu no texto, no texto original. Então, a tradução foi filtrada pela sua, digamos, homofobia. Um, Graves chooses English words that stigmatize same-sex same sexual acts. So, this is a problem, you know, when you use words that uh, are giving values to something that, that had other types of values. So, he chooses words that stigmatize same-sex same sex sexual acts as perverse, a question raised about um, his sexual reputation becomes a specific charge of unnatural practices. Então, esse, essa ideia de unnatural practices, que não, não existia, ou unnatural, que não tinha no, no original. Outra coisa, essa expressão, que significa sharing the same tent, significa companionship or intimacy, Virou keramite, uh, a term of abuse in the early modern period for boys who were the sexual objects of men. É, eu procurei o que é keramite, é exatamente isso, não é uma palavra usada mais, mas é uh, meninos né, usado para, uh, para, uh, como objeto sexual. E que não era o caso, o caso em, em latim era essa expressão que significa sharing the same tent, companionship or intimacy e virou keramite, que é totalmente estigmatizante. Um, this reflects a post-war homophobia that linked homosexuality with a fear of totalitarian government, communist and political subversion through uh, espionage. Claro que o tradutor pode não ter consciência das ideologias que estão influenciando suas escolhas tradutórias. As I've been saying, uh, our word choices are ideologically influenced and we are not conscious about that. So, possibly, he didn't have any idea that he was being homophobic. Possibly, I don't know. Not just by stigmatizing Caesar's sexuality, but by presenting the stigma as a historical fact. So, if you're reading the text in English, you you say you think that if you're reading the Twelve Caesars in English, you're being you're gonna be influenced by the idea that um, Caesar's sexuality was uh, was stigmatized. I mean, and the stigma was a historical fact. And today we know that um, sexual practices in the past was just different from what we have today. Um, what else? Well, as an advocate of foreignization, because he's bringing these examples to criticize domestication, saying that, hey, you see, domestication didn't work in these cases. <laughs> So he's bringing these examples to criticize domestication and he advocates in favor of foreignization. Venuti believes that there is violence residing in the very purpose and activity of domestication. So um, the translators in these cases, they violated the original text. Um, so He believes that um, Venuti proposes a strategy of resistant translation, foreignization, against a tradition of smooth translation. And he advocates in favor of foreignization, saying that domestication is a violence against the source text. For him, translation is a political act, a resistance against the imposition of the target culture, which he thinks is uh, a type of imperialism. So he's saying that in these cases here, the translators were, were translating according to the ideologies of the, the time when he, they, they lived. In this case, uh, time and place 
where um, positivism and scientism and you know science and positivism were uh, dominating. So the translator had to produce a text that sounded even more scientific than it was in the original text for the translation to be, say, accepted by, uh, by the community. And in this case, the translator was being influenced by um, post-Second uh, World War when uh, he was living in, in a homophobic society and obviously being influenced by this homophobic society. So they were being dominated by the society where they lived. Quer dizer, eles estavam, esses tradutores estavam se curvando perante é, essa imposição invisível, inclusive, da sociedade cientificista ou, uh, nesse caso, homofóbica. Não estou criticando o cientificismo aqui, estou dizendo que para ser aceito, o texto de Freud para ser aceito né, na, é, como um texto científico, ele tinha que soar mais científico naquela comunidade. Em alemão não, em alemão ele já era científico, mesmo soando mais informal. Já em inglês ele tinha que soar mais formal para ser aceito como um texto científico. Então, essa, essa sociedade, essas ideias que circulam na sociedade é que estavam dominando os tradutores e de uma maneira, claro, que inconsciente. Então, os tradutores eles estão uh, produzindo os textos de acordo com a sociedade em que eles vivem. E a domesticação para Venuti é, é essa ideia de se curvar diante dessa sociedade. Então, por isso ele... Ele fala que o texto, ele fala em resistant translation, quer dizer, eu vou resistir a essa imposição da sociedade, eu vou, eu, eu vou então, fazer um texto que soe como uma tradução mesmo, porque a domesticação é uma violência contra o texto. Então, o Venuti, ele discute a é, é, estrangeirização e domesticação, mas não somente para dar, o, dar a definição, ele discute de uma maneira bastante, de um ponto de vista político. Né? É, é uma militância política contra a imposição de uma, de uma sociedade como o tradutor deveria traduzir. Mas, de novo, essa imposição não é uma ordem que vem do empregador para o empregado. É, uma, é como um, um matrix, quer dizer, ele existe né, na sociedade, mas algo que nem sempre nós temos a consciência disso. Agora, é, é, é muito polêmico, porque, como eu disse, você vai fazer um teste para uma editora, a editora não está nem aí para o que Venuti falou. E eu acho que Venuti é com um T só. Uh, a editora vai uh, analisar se a sua tradução está é, fluente, né? se ela está, inclusive, descolada do, do texto original. Essa é até uma, uma palavra que eles usam, às vezes, nas editoras. O texto descolado do texto original, a tradução descolada do texto original, significa que a, a tradução está fluente, é um texto que, que lê de uma maneira fluente, né? sem aquelas, aquele sentimento de, nossa, esse texto está esquisito, né? ou está truncado, essa tradução está truncada. Então, para o mercado de trabalho, o que ele discute é muito complicado. Para as teorias de tradução, uh, ele, ele inovou bastante, né? ele trouxe algumas discussões que não tinham sido feitas antes. Mas... É, para o mercado de trabalho mesmo, são algumas é, considerações um pouco complicadas. Então, o Venuti é polêmico, ele é bastante polêmico. Ele traz uma discussão que, que abre os olhos dos tradutores, é, dos estudos da tradução, né? não, não do tradutor do mercado de trabalho, mas dos estudos da tradução. E, por outro lado, para o mercado de trabalho é, é algo impraticável, na verdade. Você ser um, um tradutor militante falando que o tradutor tem que ser visível, sim, porque é uma, é uma violência, a domesticação do texto é uma violência no texto original e você está se curvando diante do, do imperialismo da cultura de chegada. Né? A cultura de chegada ela tem, ela tem como aqui, né? qual era a cultura de chegada aqui? A ciência tinha, quer dizer, 
a, a imposição é esse texto tem que soar científico, senão a tradução não vai uh, não vai ser aceita pela comunidade. E aqui esse texto ele tem que ser readable. Sim, só que o autor ele foi influenciado pela é, por uma sociedade pela pelas ideias homofóbicas e acabou explicando, quer dizer, você lê, se você leu a tradução em inglês, você começa a ter um certo preconceito né, contra a, as práticas sexuais que, que aparecem no livro e que originalmente, pelo que eu entendi do, do, dos comentários do Venuti, não tem nada de, de preconceituoso nas práticas sexuais é, é, descritas no livro, apresentadas no livro. Ah, bom, enfim... O tradutor, sim, ele, ele se curva diante da, da sociedade em que ele vive, porque ele tem que produzir uma tradução que é aceitável para essa sociedade. E, e o que é aceitável? São os, os jurados né, da aula passada que eu comentei, são os jurados, nós estamos sendo, sendo analisados o tempo todo. Então, nós nos curvamos diante dessa, desses jurados e dessa cultura que vai dizer como que a tradução, qual qual tradução é aceitável ou não. E aí, é, por exemplo, eu estou numa cultura em que a tradução tem que ser domesticada porque ela tem que ser, uh, ela tem que soar natural. Então é assim que eu vou fazer a minha tradução. Venuti acha que isso é é imperialismo, que o tradutor não deveria se curvar diante desse imperialismo, deveria ser mais rebelde e fazer a tradução parecer tradução mesmo. É, como um gênero textual, tradução, gênero textual, ao invés de ser romance. Não, não é romance, é tradução de um romance. Então, é um gênero textual à parte. E, então, ele traz essa discussão de domesticação e estrangeirização, não só apresentando é, a definição, mas com uma discussão que vai muito além. É uma discussão política que ele traz para os termos domesticação e estrangeirização. Bom, é isso, eu vou disponibilizar este livro inteiro, ok? Eu tenho ele aqui e vou disponibilizar então para vocês.